I've said it once, I'll say it again. This is my excuse for everything. I'm back from the hospital. I was in the hospital. What fun I had. I can tell you such an adventure I had. So I go to the doctor last Wednesday at 2.30 in the afternoon, which was when I had my appointment. And I walk into the doctor's office and I'm sitting there and he says, he says, you know, I didn't plan this thing out very well. <laughs> oh, great, Doc. Great idea. Thanks for letting me know. So, so what they have to do is they have to put a, a, um, a port into my body where they can pour the poisons in. It's called a Hickman catheter. It has two ports. I have this little thing hanging down here now. It's like two little beads and it'll jangle and, and bungle. And then four more times in the next four months, they'll, they'll just plug into this and for three days they'll pour poison into my body. Why do they pour poison in? They do that to kill all the cancer cells, but it also kills lots of other kinds of cells. Right now, I'm in a good place. Um, I feel pretty good. I, I have a little bit of nausea. Uh, if I just walk out of the room, no, it's because I have to. Okay? I just have to. Don't leave because I leave. No, you can't leave. <laughs> Okay. Um, in in about a week or a week from today, in particular, if you have a cold, a f some fluish symptoms, you're sniffling, you you have a fever, please don't come to class. My white cell count right now is relatively normal. I will go get a shot this afternoon to help boost that. But a week from today, I expect my white cell count to be at zero. You understand what it means when your white cell count is at zero? You can't defend against any sicknesses. No immunity whatsoever. Um, you got it. Brushing your teeth is important and all of the rest. But we'll also have, I will also have the problem uh, that my platelet count will go way low. So if you smack me upside the head, I will bruise. And you, your handprint will still be there, so we'll catch you, okay? So do not, a week from now, do that. All right, now, if you look at our syllabus for today, we're going to be working on, we're going to be working on uh, perception, rules, scripts, and schemata, rules, schemata, and scripts, and how to improve your perceptions. We were supposed to review your second, the second writing. That meant that you had to have the second writing with you. How many of you have the second writing with you? Okay. I know what I talked about. Well, that doesn't really help you at the review. So we cannot go with the review. And the gods of technology, as I said earlier, the gods of technology were against me today. So we will review this first thing in the next class. You'll also be talking about the paper first date sexual expectations, the effects of who asked who paid date, location, and gender from the July-August 2010 COM studies. Now, you all saw the video. I got a I got, uh, comment from several people that said, um, I, the end of the video doesn't tell me what to do. It just ends. So I, I took care of that for you. I wanted you to have the experience of, excuse me, of actually trying to get an interlibrary loan. But the deal is when 20 people ask for the same interlibrary loan, the librarian gets one copy and does what I did, which is distribute it to you directly. So you should have gotten in your email uh, a copy of this article attached to an email. There was no attachment. She said it was too large. Oh, I'll try it. What I will do is I will post it in just a couple of minutes, uh, actually right after our class, I'll post it on the website. It'll be under handouts, uh, and and it'll be all by itself. I'll have I'll have a special category that says it'll be right at the top, readings, and you can just pick it up from there. I want to I want to warn you, this is not easy reading. Don't plan to do this just before you're gonna, you know, like. Emily, don't do this right after practice that nap time. Don't read it then, because yeah, because 
because that's going to put you to sleep. This is hard reading. This is hard reading, especially if you've never done, if you've never done uh, social science, a social science article. Okay, and our big interest in this article is who's the who is the population? What's the evidence? What's the generalization? So pay attention to those things as you go. Who's the population? What's the evidence? What's the generalization? For today, then, I have tried something a little different. Instead of a PowerPoint, I've done a Prezi presentation. And let's see if it works from here. Here it goes. You will find this on our bookmarks. Okay? If you've never, if you have never done Prezi, it's a real interesting way of doing Right, right. And connecting dots and stuff. It connects dots and stuff and, and gets you into this thing. So, let's make sure we can get there. Why got to be like that for me? All I ask is, does it help connect dots? And then like, give me the eye like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, that's not what it give you the eye. Now can I can I write another paper about how I'm being stereotyped? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Go to where I want to go. I have not used this. I have not used this tool all that often, so my use will not be will not be perfect. Okay, so this is this is all about perceptions and how we get them through rules, schemata, and scripts. With a little bit at the end about how to get your how to improve your perceptions. You'll find this in the textbook. To do, to do, to do. Beginning on ah, beginning on page thirty six. If you want to, if you want to download or print a copy of this, you certainly are welcome to do that. I generally start when I think about perceptions by asking the question, why do I see what, what isn't there? What do I miss what is? Now you may think that that's, uh, that's an obvious falsehood. You may think of yourself and say, I see what there is to see. Yes, Katie? Would you, would you say, I see what there is to see? When there's like optical illusions and there's like the specific ones, it's... It can be more difficult when you yeah. do optical illusions, which Katie gives us the perfect segue into this optical illusion. What do you see? What do you see? Well, it's a hat. Okay, somebody sees a hat. It's an old lady. It's an old lady. Bobby, what do you see? All right, you see the old lady. And it's another woman facing. Probably 45 degrees. I see the lady facing. You see the old lady facing over this way. Yes, yes. The old lady, it starts with her ear. And then her eyes, like, yeah. Got it. Very good. Nicely done, Melody. Right. She is Nicely done. Do you, do you not see the old lady? The old lady, you see. Right? Okay, the lips are the next. If you see here. this as her nose, mm -hmm. and that's her nostril. Do you now see the old lady? No. Still don't see her, huh? Don't worry about it. You see the neck? See what the necklace is on the neck? Those are lips. Those are her lips. It's a classic optical illusion. Why do we see what we see? 
One of the first reasons we see what we see is because of the rules. We make analogies to other things that we have known or that we have heard or that we have experienced. This morning after, after watching some Mike and Mike, I was watching uh, a little bit of political commentary and uh, the, the politics was talking about, the political figures were talking about third parties. And so they, the, the, the guy who was, who was saying, yeah, we are likely to have third party this fall, was comparing our situation now with our situation 20 years ago when Bill Clinton was president and we we're approaching the end of his first term and H. Ross Perot, excuse me, H. Ross Perot ran on a third party ticket. And he said the situation now is worse, or no, was worse then, but, but you have the same kinds of, of feelings now that you had then. And he was, making, he was making this very elaborate analogy. You'll do this all the time. You'll do it, for example, Cecilia's a singer, right? How do you know, when you look at two notes, what to sing? Uh, I don't have perfect pitch. Some people can just say it, you know, and sing it, but right. it is relative. You know relative. So you can sing the first note, and you'll sing the next note. Well, how do you know to do that? And the last thing, what have you done a lot of your life? Practice. You've done that. You've practiced it. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the things that happens. You practice. You practice. Emily, yes. how do you know when, you, when you've got a good double play going? What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? That's kind of vague. Well, you have to have everybody in position. Ah. Everyone has to understand what's going on. Like if one person doesn't see that other runner, then they're not going to be there, so you're not going to have the opportunity to do it. And how do you know that? Because I've worked on it. Because you've long. worked on it. You've practiced it. And our experience allow us to make certain rules. And the rules are often expressed as analogies. One thing is like another. This situation is like another situation. Now, when you're staying within the fabric of, say, a sport or singing or art, it's relatively easy to make those analogies. But what happens when you step outside and you say something like, uh, the president, current presidential race is like uh, the last Super Bowl, uh, the last playoff, last set of NFL playoffs. What happens when you make that kind of an analogy? The current presidential race, the, let's just take the primaries. The primaries in Michigan are like the Giants rise to the Super Bowl. Think about that for a second. Have you been following the, the Republican primaries at all? Do you follow politics at all? It's very interesting because um, uh, Rick Santorum uh, you really need to know a little bit about Santorum. Uh, if you, and I hope you will vote in the fall election, that you will if you are eligible to vote, Dujana. I mean, I don't know if you're a citizen or not. Okay, but I hope you will vote in, in, in the fall election if you are eligible to vote, and that you will make your choice known. But so you should know something about the candidates. But Rick Santorum was running at the bottom, and he is now at the top of the Michigan primary. What, what happened to the Giants? Underdog. Where were the Giants in, in December? Underdog. What, what was their record? What was the Giants' record in December? Nine and seven. Nine and seven. Super Bowl record? What was, it, what was the Packers' record? <laughs> 14 and, they ended up 14 and, or, yeah, 14, 15 and one. But they were like 13 and one at the beginning of December. Who are you going to pick? Who would you pick? between the Packers and the Giants. Nine and seven, 13-1. Packers, right? Absolutely. So now we have this, com what happens if we make this analogy and say that Rick Santorum's rise is sort of like, is sort of like the Giants coming from behind in the Super Bowl? Are you serious? Yeah, our defense was trash this past year. 
<laughs> Mr. Scott, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> we hate on the Packers. Oh. They play well as a team. Okay. Oh. Yeah, but let's let's stick with this analogy. Let's let's stick with this analogy. Yeah. What happens if we if we try to if we try to make the analogy? Rick Santorum is like is like the New York Giants. What happens? Megan, what happens? What do we look? What do we expect then for Santorum? Well, Santorum is like the Giants. What did the Giants finally do? They won, right? So what will we expect for Santorum? To win. To win. So we're predicting a come from behind win, right? It's like they're in they're in the playoffs and Santorum is is now in that position of the Giants and he's likely to win. What's the problem with the analogy? Is politics football? No. No. Football relies upon your skill as a player, your team skill together as players. It relies upon your being a team and putting it together. What does politics rely upon? Teams. Yeah, it relies a little bit on team. Money. Other Money. Yeah, money. What else does it rely upon, Melody? Other people's perception of you. People's perceptions of you. Things that, things that doesn't matter. People like the Giants? Brandon, people like the Giants? Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. yeah Heck yeah. Lot. There's a lot to like. Yeah. Eli. Eli. Lots else, too. People like, people hate the Giants? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Does it matter? No, not in the least. People like Santorum? Sure. People hate Santorum? Sure. Does that matter? You bet. You got to have enough likers to overcome the haters. Okay? So that's a little different. A little different. We set up rules. They're often called analogies. They affect our perception of, of reality. For example, one of the rules is contrast. Two unlike things. Two things that look on, on the surface as not being alike are... Dujan? Two things that on the surface don't look like they're, they're at all alike. Are they like or unlike? unlike. They're unlike, right? <laughs> okay. So Cecilia and Katie, like or unlike? Like in certain ways, unlike in other ways. Like, but which, which is they? Which more? Are they more like or unlike? Depends on how general you're looking at it. Exactly, and and just on the surface, like. we'd say they're probably more like than unlike. We might get into it and discover. They're very, they're actually, despite the fact that they look alike and they share a gender, that they're very unlike. We don't know yet. But contrast and similarity are two of the primary rules that we use in order to create our rules, our analogies for life. Unlike things, things that look unlike are unlike. Things that look alike, despite perhaps some surface differentials, are in fact alike. And we use these rules to create a set of mental patterns called schemata. And from these schemata, we end up drawing stereotypes. And we're going to talk more about stereotypes and the ways that they they affect us, Stephen. Give me, a, give me a, how a stereotype has affected you. My, my writing? Tell, yeah, tell me about what's in your writing. Well, I'm a visiting ambassador for the school, of course. Yeah. And on um, days that students and parents visit to go here. <laughs> no, 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 don't give, don't give him a hard time yet. Let, let, let him go. Stephen, on days when students okay. come. Okay. <laughs> um, we have like a student panel. Yeah. And the parents and students come and they can ask questions about college life or what to get involved into. And then there's like, when they ask a question, there's like two girls, two boys, and I'm the only black guy. So, of course, they're like, okay, can he speak or can he talk? Or does he use slang or language so called ebonics? Right. And so the question comes around 
and there's like an odd look on the parent's face, like, what is he going to say, or what language will he speak in that we may not have a clue. And it's just like they have an odd look on their face, as well as the students, like, can he speak? And so when I speak, it's just like they shake their head up and down, like, oh, he can talk. <laughs> like, and it's funny because I see it, but it's like they think I don't recognize him. Exactly, exactly. So, so one of the major stereotypes, one of the major schemata that we have, the general, general mental rule, have, they have to do with race. Yes? Yeah. Gender is another. I mean, we have all kinds of schemata about race and gender. We have all kinds of schemata about students and professors. These kind of mental constructs or mental structures, they allow, they allow us to organize our thought. Are they always wrong? No. No, sometimes they're based upon things we actually know. For example, this spot here, where, where these four intelligent, wonderful young women are sitting, this is the sweet spot in the classroom. This is where A students sit. Did you know that? And these two chairs, that, that row and these two chairs, are what's known as the magic T. And it's always filled with A students. And A students always sit there. Now that you know that, where do you want to sit, Ashley? Right here. You want to sit in the magic tea, right? Does that make you an A student? No. No, but that's the mental construct, the mental general idea about people that I might use to organize them. These schemata then get organized into scripts. Scripts are rules about how people should conduct an action or how an event should run, or um, how a procedure should happen. The, the um, video that didn't quite work for you, that I'm going to have to re-record, or re-upload, or see what's wrong with it, was a script on how to get an interlibrary loan. What other events in life are script? Are scripted? Do you mind? A scripted event. Uh, well, going to class, like have a schedule and everything. Okay, you have a schedule to go to class. Um, Cody, give me a scripted event. Um, <laughs> well, that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> Something that's put together so that you have to go from step one to step two to step three. A science lab, exactly. Exactly. A science lab is a good scripted e example of scripting. The most common script you will encounter, though, is the script that you encounter when you go out to dinner. Yeah. 